Gun crime in Dublin has claimed another life today, the second in less than 24 hours. You know, when you stop a car, or you stop somebody involved in the feud, there's a high chance there's drugs or firearms in the car. The front passenger keeps reaching down into the front compartment. Get out! Get out! Get out! This isn't going to go away overnight. Organised crime has been run like a business. They're not going to stop doing what they do. So it's important that we continue to target those. It's all coming down to status and power, and you know they have to be seen to not care and to be the most violent and you know wretched of everybody. All right, stay away. Come on, all right. Access to firearms is definitely gone way up. Are they easily accessible? Absolutely, they are. They're only designed for one thing, which is killing people. Hello, Garda. How are you doing? Just shooting there, matches down there. Uh, where, where, where is that? Where? In gangland crime, very often it can be difficult to progress because generally the people who are killed have a lot of enemies. I'm formally arresting you for the attempted murder. You're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so, but anything you do say will be taken down in writing. So organised crime is where crime takes on a structure and it's a business and it's been run like a business by people. It's a group of like-minded individuals that don't care who gets affected by what they do once they make money. That's the reality of it. There are numerous types of organised crime. We have cyber crime, we have human trafficking. You have gangs involved in cash and transit robberies the hole in the wall gangs that go around the ATM machines and this kind of thing. The most common one, I suppose, would be drug trafficking and firearms. They all have the same common design of committing serious offences to benefit the organisation as a whole. They have seized more than one and a half million euro worth of cocaine and heroin and 700,000 euro worth of cash in a series of raids. The people on the ground, obviously, are the people that are most affected with regard to community harm, with regard to their families, with regard to the drug debt intimidation. And there are the upper tiers that don't and ultimately stay out of the limelight. The real heavy hitters are Lionel Lilo's in Dubai. Why they were able to line a Lilo, you know, and invest in multi-billion or million dollar businesses, like, is because the people on the ground are putting the money back up to them. They stopped and searched a car, they searched a house as well, and a total of 374 kilos of cannabis herb was seized. And this is estimated to have a street value of 7.4 million euro. To be an organised crime gang, you can have a small family there, five or six of them, dealing a serious amount of drugs, and they're really doing it underneath the radar. They know how to play the game. So we're just heading up to a grow house here. There's hundreds of plants in all the rooms in the house. And uh, there was one suspect there who managed to escape as the search was being conducted. So there's the whole house destroyed. You can get the smell of it. So we have all these vent pipes that are ventilating and ventilating up through the attic and out of the house. And then there's over 200 plants. You have all your lights here, your junction boxes. Like, they're using some amount of power. At the moment, we're just dismantling the grow house. In relation to the plants, we take samples from the plants in each room. They go to FSI, and they will do an analysis for us. But the rest of, say, here, the plants, you can see the buds around them. It's our responsibility to dismantle this whole place uh, so that it can't be used in future or set up again as a grow house. That's basically what we're doing at the moment. Like. What happens is someone will come here once a week and drop off the shopping firm, you know? And but they'll be taking these now because the smell, their head will be busting, so they'd literally be taking any amount of them a day, like, and you know, like, it's not good for you. Drugs absolutely cause the ruination of families. We were talking recently about the, the impact of drug debt intimidation. That's huge. Uh, Roger, I'm not supposed to be linked one or two over the call there earlier. Right? Yeah. The house was supposed to be smashed up there just before nine o'clock. Oh, God. Really? 
drug debt intimidation is where a criminal decides that someone owes him a debt for selling drugs. He sets about recouping this debt by putting pressure on the individual himself or possibly members of his family. When somebody owes a bill for drugs, whether that's been that they were given drugs to sell and they haven't given back the proceeds or whether they built up a bill from their own personal use and they haven't paid back the money, there will be intimidation to pay that debt. To be a successful drug dealer, you cannot be nice. To conduct intimidation, you need to be strong. You need to show your you, you need to show that you're not afraid to get stuck in and commit serious crime to do that. There's always an escalation of violence. You have to be seen as harder harder than the last fella. All right, stay away, come on, all right? Is he stopped, is he? Uh, Trevor. How are you? He's a cut to his head. He's in and out of consciousness that he can't see now. OK. The yeah, FBI here with a fellow. It looks like he's been attacked. He's in a bad way. He's in there with consciousness. He was losing his sight there. The, the lads were here with him. So the FBI have just arrived. What happened? Yeah, Seven. That night, I was coming up with hammers and I have them. Right. Oh, uh, do you have any pain anywhere at the moment? Yeah, there's things like something. Your head, that's what. Back in the head. Any pain anywhere else? Back. You hit me on the back. I'm not hammers on. You tell me what day of the week it is. Right, we only have that. Kill me. Okay. You know what year it is? Since hell's been 10th, isn't it? Okay. Where a drug dead intimidation has occurred at a house, the ambulance is outside, the guards are outside, but they're watching that this person coming out of the house has severe injuries, usually blood dripping from them, wrapped in bandages and taken off in the back of an ambulance. And that is what the young people and the neighbours are seeing relating to drug debt intimidation. So if you're going to ask a neighbour to tell me what's going on in relation to your drug debt intimidation, they're not going to do it. Yeah, so it seems a number of males, there's talk of seven or there's talk of four males, attacked him at the house. Um, there's injuries to his head, but some kind of blood trauma on one side and maybe a stab wound or something on the other side. So hopefully his condition improves and we can speak to him and, and find out from him directly. Uh, but that probably won't be today uh, or tomorrow. We just have to see how he goes. They're, they're in doing an MRI up there and he's unconscious. Drug debt intimidation ultimately is one of our biggest issues at the minute. To the extent that, that the guards have a particular programme set up to try and manage that and how we can address and target the people and, and more importantly, how we can support the families that are going through that. It's not always about making a complaint or identifying who's responsible, but it's about supporting people and work through that level of fear that, that they're experiencing. <laughs> Gangland and drug crime has been basically normalized. It's been glamorized. It's the topic of all the conversations on social media, on news articles. It's what you're waking up to every morning. You're hearing about shootings, the next person's killed, and it's through social media that this has been done. We have situations where people have been very seriously injured and that's about making sure that people don't say no. They don't say no to these gangs, that whatever it is that they choose that they want, that they can have. What happened? You were arrested with me and you had drugs on me. You were a Yeah, what did you have again? I had the four trays of the same old 25 bag of weight. 25 bag of weight, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was more, it was a couple of grams. We would have put the street value up one day. It was a nice bag, wasn't it? Yeah. Wasn't it a cracker of a bag, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I went the whole way down to get it, yeah. It was half of that one, wasn't it? It was. Was it, yeah? What, what do you mean it was? was? Oh, yeah, dirty little rat. Get me moody. Do you want to kill it? Looks like he sent this young lad down to do a drug deal for him or collect drugs. 
young lad got caught with it. Uh, you can see he's putting words in the young lad's mouth. He's stabbing him and beating him. Sure, no matter what he says, he's saying yes to him. Uh, you're not going to get a charge sheet anyway for a small amount of drugs. No matter what, it has to be sent away for analysis. You normally only get a sheet for uh, unless a large amount. So he's wrong there anyway. Now, I don't know anything about that case, but just going on his looks, he looks like he could be under 18. That could be a reason why he didn't get a charge sheet. It could be the first time he's ever been in trouble. That could be another reason why he didn't get a charge sheet. But it's this man trying to make out that he's the big lad and if anybody else rats on him, they're going to get a rat scare. Like, I find, I do find it hard to watch and I find it hard to understand how... Child. Yeah, you know, like how he could get into that situation, but... I suppose it's just pure fear and intimidation and then he's spread across the internet as being a rat and being this and being that, you know, he's going to have to deal with that now as well. There has been a greater increase in violence, I think, over the last couple of years, but um, I suppose violence has always been a part of organised crime and crime gangs. And, and it all comes back to the same thing. This is about drugs, this is about money, this is about control. You have crime gangs that are prepared to get involved in very violent crimes, and they want that level of violence. You find that it's not cold and calculated all the time either. It's ultimately, it's, it's a reaction to something that's already occurred. They have to be seen to react. That criminal organization expects them to react. The public on the street in their area expect them to react. They can't be seen to, to lose face. That's the reality of it. And they have to be more vicious and more violent than the last. Vicious, callous attack. You now, in my eyes, it was absolutely planned. This man came with a machete to, to attack a fella. He had obviously surveilled him in some shape or form. That happened right outside the Garda station door where someone was slashed and an attempted murder charge has been preferred. You've got witnesses standing waiting on the bus, nurses coming from work, people going coming from school, children that were standing around watching. It's them that you have to try and feel sorry for. It's them we have to do our job for. It just shows the level that they, the, of violence that they have, they will go to to conduct a criminal act against another person to get retribution against somebody that they believe that has done them wrong. They've no issue doing it in broad daylight, two o'clock in the day outside a guard station. That's the level of violence that we've, we're ultimately gone to in society. That it's not that it's acceptable. It's a case that it just became more of an norm. It's all coming down to status and power and, you know, keeping your gang as the one that has control of whatever area you're, you have control of. The level of violence, I wasn't shocked at. I wasn't shocked that it happened outside a guard station. You know, I was just shocked that he survived. Where there are people causing specific problems in the community, what they're doing is committing crime, and that causes a negative effect on society. You know, our job, our mission is to keep people safe, to prevent, detect crime. So there's an onus on us to target these individuals. I've been in situations myself and you have somebody that puts himself about as a hitman, as somebody to be feared, somebody who's regularly very violent, and suddenly they become vulnerable. And they turn to the guards and look for us to help them. And I've seen those people cry and you see a very different person than who puts on a show of bravado out in the community. <laughs> Big man. Oh, 
Brave, no, were you? I'm sorry. What did you do? What did you do? You're like a baby, didn't you? What did you do? Oh, I can't see. I'm sorry. Oh, it is nice. I'm sorry. What did you do? There's a lot of people out there that have to show face and, and on, on the street have to be seen as the toughest, hardest individuals. You put them in handcuffs, you bring them back to the lonely place that is a guard station and they're a totally different person. Any crime gang that has been successful has been successful because they have trust within that crime gang. Within families come trust and it's it's harder to break down uh, a crime gang where you have people that actively work to support each other to make sure that they don't get caught. You can trust your family uh, uh, more than you can trust anybody outside of it. That will go with any of these criminal families that they, they trust very few people and the people that they do trust need to be very close to them. Kilo two to control. No. Control, can I get talk through to the Romeo Sierra unit that's down for the DMR West, please? Stop, 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 stop. You talk, you talk. Hey, just back there to the left. Right. Yeah, two kilo to Romeo Sierra unit there. Can we get you down to, please? Things can just happen in an instant. So there was people come up to purchase a firearm and we didn't know who they were. We were literally on patrol and we see someone who we suspect is involved in a feud and has access to firearms and stuff. And we made the right connection. His son, unbeknownst to us, had gone out of the car and was literally in a walkway in a wooded area beside us and had thrown the gun when he seen us. Put him in the car. He had been um, reported for doing drive off, so basically not paying for petrol at pumps. So when we seen him, I knew that we would have the power of arrest in relation to that. So that meant that we would, you know, be able to take him out safely, but not, I suppose, let him know there may be something going on in the area. It was very much we knew that he had not been paid for petrol and that we had to arrest him for that. I'll just give you a quick search before, uh... oh well, I won't be searching, the lads will be, obviously. Just a quick, uh, none of you, there shouldn't be. Just put them in cuffs. Don't have to be rough. No, no one's being rough. I'm just putting you in cuffs. It's not a surprise when I see a bulletproof vest on anybody, to be honest with you. There are so many young people, males especially, that are walking around with bulletproof vests. Like a badge of honour sometimes. They know that they've created a situation where somebody is going to target their lives. They're prepared to target somebody else's. So the only thing they can do to keep themselves safe is wear a bulletproof vest. For us, that was how quickly that instant moved. We were trying to set up with the armed support unit because we're unarmed, you know, getting the local DDU and then up the road then, our other unit stopped a car with four unknowns in it, a female, her son, her nephew, and another chap in the car. People perceive that fathers have a huge influence in respect of, of encouraging their kids into the world of criminality. The most serious criminals that I have dealt with have probably actually been influenced by their mother. What's you doing with all the cash in the shop? My cash. Huh? My cash. Your cash for? For work. Four and a half grand in cash. Four and a half. What are you doing with the vest on I'm there, it's up there. Boy. It's not where it is for protection, you know? Families consider the mothers to be caregivers and the people who keep their children safe. And here we have situations where the mothers are the ones who are forcing their kids to make money through criminality. People don't understand how these things happen, like, you know, how organised crime happens, but it happens because people are more than willing to be involved in it. There's a mother with her child willing to go and push the firearm and willing to be the one who holds the money. Now, right, we bring you down to search. You've been searched before, yeah? Yeah. So, if you have anything on you that you shouldn't, no, now would be the best time to tell no, us. Yeah. Your young fella has a vest on him, does he? Bulletproof, yeah? 
I don't think she's innocent in it in any way. Like, I would suspect that she is probably a bigger player in the organised crime network than what he is even. Started a new job, your mum was saying. Are you um, wearing the vest and walk? No. I think sometimes with women, people don't see them as active criminals when, in fact, they're probably one of the better criminals out there because no one suspects that a woman would be carrying the cash or the firearm. You know, we had the prisoners in there, we seen a suspicious vehicle and there was a, a female searched and found with four rounds of cash. We searched the area uh, surrounding where the four persons were seen and the crew were after finding the gun with the silence around it, like here. So it's actually a fantastic, fantastic result. My Hi. God. No, that wasn't me. It wasn't covered over. It covered over the shoulder, so I just saw this. And when I started on the guards, you recover a firearm, it was a big deal. At the minute, it's not its not as big a deal at all. We're recovering firearms on a weekly, monthly basis now. And after finding it kind of, like, pushed up against a tree, like, so we're just trying to get someone from scenes of crime out now. And we got, obviously, the four grand on the female. So, like, that, you know, we've gotten it, like, you know, that's the one that was going to be sold. Gun crime in Dublin has claimed another life today, the second in less than 24 hours. Yes, well, this shooting happened at 11 o'clock this morning. Two guns have been recovered by Gardaí as part of ongoing operations targeting organised crime gangs. There's a massive increase in firearms and it's harder and harder for us to find them because they're not keeping them within their houses anymore. They're not stupid to keep them in the houses. So where do you find it? It's like a needle in a haystack. But when it's called upon, it's quickly available to them. Just on your left there. <laughs> I'm going to take a non-intimate DNA sample from you now, and that's pursuant to Section 11.2 of the Criminal Justice Forensic Evidence and DNA Database Systems Act 2014. Given that you're a detained person, detained under Section 30 of the Offences Against the State Act, the authorization has been given by Detective Inspector Thelma Waters. Years ago, I suppose, we seen that firearms were expensive and they changed hands quite regularly. Now firearms are being dumped after a murder, after an attempted murder, because people don't want to take the risk of getting caught with a firearm on, on another job. So we know now that guns are cheap in this country. They're no longer expensive as, as they were years ago. Firearms have, are obviously, they're small with the amount of export-import stuff coming into the country, it, it is very easy to get drugs and firearms into the country. Firearms are coming in on the back of drugs hauls a lot of the time. Are they easily accessible? Absolutely, they are. They're only designed for one thing, which is killing people. Hello, Garda. Hello, you doing? It's shoot, shooting there in Blanchett down there. Uh, where, uh, where, 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 where? Emergency service. Blanchard, someone's up again, shot dead. Can you bring an ambulance, please, instead of taking so long? <laughs> Did you see the shooting happen? Just, just heard bang, bang, bang. Just seen someone run down beside me, van. He just ran up that way and into a car. Did you see who did it? Yeah. He's moving there, one of the chaps is at the sign there, but we don't know. There's several units on the way up there, OK? Now to some breaking news this evening. Garthia at the scene of a shooting in Blanchardstown in West Dublin. A man in his 20s was treated at the scene for gunshot wounds in the Briarswood area. The attack happened at 5pm. The victim, who's known to Garthia, was targeted while he sat in a van. Once a call like that comes in, you know that you have people that are trying to get away from the scene of an incident. So you're looking at what's your best opportunity in how we can meet them leaving that scene. When the call comes in, we, we get to the scene, you're, you're listening out. You're anticipating a car being burnt out somewhere else. We have there now a car fire at the minute there in Sadler's Grove, be you on the way there, so we'll be uh, from that shooting that's going on there at Briarwood. Gardaí discovered a burnt out car close by in the Sadler's Drive area. There's evidence to be found there, so you're looking at getting to the scene, preserving any evidence that's 
available? Where's the evidence going to lead you from there? You're looking at CCTV, you're looking for witnesses, you're appealing for assistance from the public. Gardaí are very keen to speak to any witnesses. In particular, Gardaí want to speak to any drivers or anyone who has dash cam footage. In gangland crime, very often, it can be difficult to progress because there are a number of motives. Generally, the people who are killed have a lot of enemies. Everything was on the table in this investigation because initially, I suppose, you're looking at you don't have an early success around arresting somebody fleeing from the scene or at the scene. So you're considering all your strands. You have a, a driver, you have a gunman, and you probably have other people who are involved in the logistics behind the crime in the first place. So you're thinking of lots of things and trying to coordinate people and gather evidence. We set about harvesting any CCTV footage that was there to be got. That's a, that's a time sensitive task. So we have a lot of people, a lot of resources dedicated to gathering that evidence. So we gather that CCTV evidence, we review it. The gunman got out of the car and fired three shots that struck Lee Boylan in the neck. You know, those bullets are still in his neck. They're too close to his spine to remove. What actually happened was his vein and artery in his neck joined and stemmed the flow of blood. But it was just miraculous piece of medical luck that he's still alive. It was very carefully planned out. There was a bit of surveillance conducted. There was num numerous people involved. There was cars used. Ultimately, in this case, it was it was CCTV that gave us the strength of evidence that we had to connect this person to the crime. After a period of time, we we were able to establish that Alan Graham was a suspect. We picked up Alan Graham leaving Sadler's estate quite soon after the BMW was burnt out, and we followed him. So observed him getting into a taxi in Mulhuddert and getting dropped over to Finglas. The taxi driver noted, noted when he was interviewed at an early stage, remarked upon the smell of smoke from his clothing, which was obviously as a result of him setting the car on fire. I suppose we had suspects in mind at an early stage. And CCTV evidence in Finglas led us to other areas in the wider Dublin area, which resulted in us searching their dwellings and, and affecting a number of arrests. Right, lads, um, we're going to crack on. We're seeking specific evidence in different houses, and we have to be focused on that. Um, that could be a make or break for us um, as regards getting directions from DPP later on. So just I would ask that those that are going to be on the searches stay focused on that front. Great work done by a lot of people, and I suppose uh, we're going to have a couple of really busy days now this week as well just to try to do something so we can take it all. Thanks to our colleagues for from our support and the ERU for assisting us this morning as well. The searches that we have are specific, they're information or evidence led and you're looking at how you can gather more evidence against the crime gang you know has ordered this attempted murder. <laughs> Right, what's going to happen is we're going to be in and out as quickly as we can, all right? So we're looking for evidence in relation to a serious incident, all right? So what I'll tell you is, if we get it, I'll show it to you before we leave. Grant, before we take us out of the room, we'll give you a quick search. Nothing on you that it shouldn't be. No, only my shoe, Bob. Only a few, Bob. Well, look, yeah, we'll take it out there and hand it over. And we'll just, just leave it. Yeah. Grant, only... Eight grand there, yeah? Perfect, we'll see us that off. Yeah, perfect, but we'll take that from an Anything else on you? Great, I'll go through what we're seizing then. So really, we're taking the runner's two phones and the money, yeah. So there was eight searches on this morning, ranging from Limerick to Coolock. Um, and basically any evidence that is gathered, i.e. money. Um, we have over here, we have clothes, phones, um, car seats, um, which might seem insignificant, but basically there was a car seat left in one of the vehicles um, that was bought and was subsequently used in a shooting. So they were all seized from Blakestown. This is 9,000 euro in cash. Uh, in donations of 50 euros and 500 euro notes, was found in a coffee jar in a park in Hearthstown. This one was found by an army man who was giving us a dig out searching. Uh, this was found by Sergeant Proudfoot 
this one was found underneath the armpit of a lady in a house that was searched this morning. So all in all, in and around nearly 20 grand, I suppose. It's just found in Hartstone Park in relation to a search we did today. And it's just a can that was buried in the ground. Yeah, with a little, uh, that had a little lid in it. Hold on, I got it there. So a little, uh, little waterproof lid on it like that. That was buried in the bushes. And then we have a little tick list here. It's just uh, names of people and maybe possibly what they owe or what not with dates and all that. You have kind of all exhibits coming from all different houses. So the job I was tasked with this morning was just getting every guard to hand in their exhibits and they get a log of them um, for continuity of evidence. So that's what I've been doing all morning, just logging everything. So we gather the evidence, we review it, and then we set about conducting a sterile interview process. We tasked a guard and a sergeant to uh, undertake that role. It led us to Limerick. The guard in charge of the investigation went to Limerick with a view to identifying uh, Alan Graham, and after a short period of time, indeed, he was identified, which led to his arrest in, in June that year. Okay, Alan, just to inform you now, you're formally being released from the prison for section 50 of the Criminal Justice Act. Okay, you're no longer being detained for the purpose of the proper investigation of the offence for which you have been arrested, all right? Right. Okay. So I've been released? And now I'm formally arresting you right. for the attempted murder of Lee Boylan on the 6th of March 2019 at Blakestown Road, Mulhudder, Dublin 15. Right. You're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so, but anything you do say will be taken down in writing and maybe given in evidence. No problem. Do you understand that? I do indeed, yeah. Is there anything you want to say? No. Okay. Thank you. Dealing with Alan Graham, initially he, he asserted that he had no contacts in Dublin, that he hadn't been in Dublin in a lengthy period of time that he'd no involvement in the shooting, didn't know who Lee Boylan was. Sometimes, in fact, uh, no comment can be beneficial to an investigation. Our, our goals when we're interviewing are sometimes protecting the evidence we do have and not letting that become diluted. But we have to give the person who's been interviewed the opportunity to explain their involvement, uh, refute their involvement. You know, we have to be fair to them as well. So that's all part of the, the process. To see him minutes after trying to take someone's life, going into the pub, high-fiving, drinking a shot of whiskey and, and having a pint was just... Ah. It was hard to fathom that someone could do that, that there are people out there that could actually do that, you know, without a care in the world. It was crazy to see. Getting the direction for Alan Graham, there's a, there's a, there was a great sense of relief. There was a great sense of pride in the investigation that was conducted so well. Every person who was involved in the investigation contributed to getting that direction. And it was one of attempted murder at the time. It's a very difficult charge to obtain. You know, the DPP don't just rubber stamp a charge like that or a direction like that. There's a very high burden of proof, very high threshold to get that. The justice system has recognised that this is very serious and the impact on the communities is very serious and we have substantial sentences then that, that are been handed down. The judges are really recognising that and, and giving substantial sentences to people when they come before the court. There has to be the element of punishment, there has to be an element of, of reparation and justice for society, you know, the victim himself, regardless even though he didn't provide a statement in this case. There has to be an element of sending out the message that those acts of crime and violence won't be tolerated by society.
It's important that we continue to focus our operations at getting those guns off the streets. Threat to life operations a lot of them come through intelligence where we believe that there is a serious threat to somebody's life. The guards are responsible for putting a plan in place to make sure that that operation is not carried out by those criminal elements. You look at uh, disrupting the operation or you look at doing an intervention and uh, apprehending the people that are responsible for plotting to kill somebody. Right, there's a chance that this is going live shortly, right? Plan is down the M50, down as far as Ballinalak, take the car at that point. Either way, they're going to be lifted for a search if we don't find something immediately, either way. like. In a lot of these operations, you try and bring in as much support as you can around you. You're relying on the expertise of, of so, some of the best trained units in the guards, like the emergency response units, the arms response units, our surveillance units. And these guys are feeding brilliant information to you. And you know their capabilities. You know how well they're trained. Roger, not to begin. If somebody can get up there and just confirm if he's in the car there, we need confirmation whether he's in it or not. If it wasn't for those people supporting the operation, the, the operation couldn't happen, simple as, because the threat is too too great. If they're given the opportunity and they believe that's, that's the way out, they will shoot a guard, simple as. These are paranoid people that are part of a criminal gang that are involved in murders, shootings, moving guns, moving drugs, moving money, all that sort of stuff. So like, if they're operating at that level where they're central to such a serious crime gang, their paranoia has to be through the roof. We have our own goals and, and our goals obviously is to catch the criminal, to stop that person getting killed or carrying out a shooting. And that's our goal and they have their job to do and it, it, it really is that cat and mouse kind of scenario. We'll green now, try and take it down as far as for here and see if you want to down there. There's a manoeuvre there happening. There they go now. Manoeuvre's happened there now. Stopped. They're going for it, Eddie. Hold on. They're still chasing there now. Go on, blue light on, blue light on. No, we're not. We're not. Hold back, Lisa. Stop, stop. Stop, just stop, stop. Okay, it stopped anyway, he's in a ditch. Right, I'll, I'll update you. We're about 200 metres back from it, so we just let them do their business. How are you, lads? How's things? Any sign of a fire? No, not yet, but. The intelligence was there that. That, that there was a firearm. Obviously, when the vehicle was stopped and the, the vehicle ends up on side, we're in the middle of an hour, it is pitch black, and you have all these things going against you. And the, the, the initial search of the car, no firearm was discovered. So obviously, we're thinking, right, where is this going? It must be, it has to be here. There's a black sack here with loads of black gloves, uh, petrol in it, a thing of bleach. There was a number of items in the car. They had a bag which contained what we believe to be accelerant, a bottle which we believe contained bleach of some sort, a lot of a lot of uh, latex gloves, and this was all located within within the vehicle. You all right? Can you get up? Yeah. Onto your yeah. side. Come on. And lift. Oh. All right. Come on. Thank you. Yeah. You're all right, yeah. Oh yeah. We'll get over it. Yeah. Everything indicated that. These people were not, as, as they suggested, to go on fishing. They were very much uh, prepared for a specific operation. They were wearing two layers of clothing. Um, we see that all the time when people are forensically aware and strip off and burn the outer layer of clothing, wish the car or, or wish whatever it is that they use. Like, ultimately, we were very satisfied that, that they were on their way to do a shooting and that they had the firearm with them. So if that meant then we had to keep a scene overnight, 
and we had to search that in the morning and daylight. That's what we do. We weren't going to walk away there, but we were completely satisfied that the firearm was or wasn't there. goal was to get that firearm off the street. To find it was absolutely brilliant. Good man, where was it? Just there under my foot. OK, perfect. 100%. <laughs> the gloves match as well. That's great, no? Any firearm you don't know, potentially, it could be live, it may not be live. We don't know if there's a there's a, uh, a round in the breech or if there's actual rounds in the firearm. So you, you prove the firearm um, before Basically, it gets transported to ensure that it doesn't go off accidentally. Yeah, I'm going to get one of the lads there who hasn't dealt with the prisoners to clear it. Yeah. So, because obviously we're looking the potential oh, of yeah, DNA yeah, or whatever. DNA so, Just pull it back. I look. No, clear. Okay. You sure, you sure Jane, you put it in the bag. Just watch your gloves. Yeah, but then it was back to the job at hand. We had two prisons that ultimately had to be interviewed in relation to this uh, incident and this alleged threat to life that we, we ultimately believed that the shooting that they were going to carry out and we had to deal with their detention. So that was only the start of it really for us. We don't use intelligence as, as evidence. The justice system operates on evidence. You're back, you're into a forensic uh, approach with your two prisoners. You're looking at them for DNA, all the different strands that you can possibly work with. How can we connect this firearm that's found outside the vehicle? How can we connect that to the people in the car? What opportunities do we have? To get all those links, ultimately, it takes investigation. So first and foremost, get our prisoners back to our station and get them started on their detentions and, and obviously interviewed them in relation to the alleged crime. Two very significant targets, lads. Um, this is actually, it, it's, it's, we know that this is not a plan that they've come up with on their own part. They've been conspiring with others um, throughout the day. So I suppose searches then of their homes at night, uh, what, what other opportunities there are for securing evidence. I don't where else. Just go and search here. It's so important to show that ultimately the guards are doing their very best to try and tackle organised crime and to tackle these people that are involved in these in these types of crime. We've sometimes had very challenging experiences. I think on every occasion we've risen to the challenge. When we do our job and we do it right, we do end up with these persons charged and before the courts and ultimately hopefully sentenced. Say it's one going off the streets and it's two two criminals and there's plenty more to replace them. This isn't going to go away overnight. Organised crime has been run like a business. They're not going to stop doing what they do. In Ireland, it's a societal problem. It's not a Garda problem. So it's going to require a concerted effort. It's going to require education, intervention, diversion of, of younger people who are on the fringes of these uh, criminal gangs. If we're going to make any headway in, in deterring people away from this sort of behaviour. Clearly, the hierarchy of these organised crime groups are being targeted by us. We will not cease until we bring about the total dismantling of the relevant organised crime groups. And if you've been affected by any of the issues raised in this programme, please visit our support page virginmediatelevision.ie forward slash helplines.